Well, I, I think that probably the, the most distinctive attribute of Buddhism is contemplative life. And I think that this is something that is, I mean, on the face of it, it's very odd. You're, you're sitting there on your butt facing a wall or facing a, a, a blank floor for 10, 12 hours a day. That is a very peculiar behavior. Right? So I, I think in, in terms of the questions that would be of great interest might be exactly that, addressing this issue. I mean, students love this idea of meditation, and I'm not sure what they think they're getting at. So why don't I talk about that? Oh, it's on. <laughs> okay. So, what is it about Buddhist meditation? Well, the first thing about Buddhist meditation, other than it's very bizarre behavior to sit still, because humans don't sit still well. We, we're not predisposed to sit still. We're not predisposed as, as primates to sit in one place with our legs crossed in peculiar circumstances, working through the pain and trying to deal with the uh, fact of inflamed tendons and, and uh, arthritis in the knees and various other kinds of things. It's not something that's natural to us. Right? And yet, after the better part of 24 centuries, now we're in a circumstance where Buddhism has gone through and validated in so many different cultural zones, and every cultural zone it has gone into, this idea of contemplative behavior. And what is it that this is about? Um, in my estimation, what we are seeing is that I, are seeing, I think we're seeing uh, the first organized movement towards Lamarckian evolution. Now, what is Lamarckian evolution? We're used to a Darwinian model of evolution. The Darwinian model of evolution is, is that genes are passed from parent to child. And it's that genetic throw of the dice in which you're relying on every generation, you're going to wipe out 10% or 20% or 30% of your generation, and therefore the ones who survive pass on the genes, and the ones who wiped out are pass on the genes. Darwin's primary competitor was Lamarck, and Lamarck maintained that no, evolution can happen within the single lifetime of an individual. And now that we know more about DNA, and we understand that, in fact, DNA replicate all the time, that cells are reformed all the time, and those cells form in all kinds of circumstances. Uh, we have nerve cells, we have muscle cells, we have... And so people do go through evolution on a regular basis, and we have the capacity to go through those evolution. And so from the time of your birth until the time you replicate, in terms of reproducing, having kids in the 20s or 30s, whatever time, you, you have gone through all kinds of evolutionary circumstances in that, in that juncture. And I think that what we're starting to end, uh, the cultural forms that because we, have, we as a species have modified our bio biology so extraordinarily by means of language, by means of symbolic thought, by means of various other kinds of things. I, re I think that what Buddhism really represents more than anything else is a, is a first movement towards a dramatic reconfiguring of what is the human person and that contemplative model allows certain kinds of forms of thought, forms of understanding to emerge that have never emerged before. To their credit, the Buddhists do not claim to have invented contemplation, but they do claim to have perfected it. And it was pointed out by Jaini to me, my Jaini's my dissertation advisor, that the Buddha is the only figure in world religion consistently represented in the attitude of meditation. And so the Buddhists may have not invented meditation, but they have placed their nickel on it. That has been, that's where they have put their emphasis. That's where they have placed. And they won't admit to that, by and large. They say, well, no, it's about insight, it's about wisdom, it's about yada, yada, whatever. It's about meditation. That's really what Buddhism is about. And so, uh, 
And that's what has been most distinctive. And now what we see in the modern world is we see Buddhist meditation leaking out into all kinds of various circumstances. I note that our counseling center here in the last two years has put into place mindfulness. Well, mindfulness is nothing more than less than Buddhist vipassana meditation warmed over, right? And so uh, this, as with usual, good usual cultural properties, has leaked out from the institutional forms. But even though it's been deinstitutionalized, if you will, nonetheless, I think that there's no question that the Buddhists are going to maintain this in a way that other institutional systems will not be able to maintain, because the simple fact of the matter is, is that you have somebody sitting on their butt for 12 hours a day for 40, 50 years, they are going to discover things about contemplative activity that other people simply will not be able to do if they're doing it 15 minutes a day off and on for four years or something. And so that kind of rigorous, deep, institutionalized experience in contemplative activity uh, is a reservoir for human cognition in a way that we have few an analogs, I think. And so I don't know that there is any specific analogy uh, to the way that Buddhists have pursued so, so aggressively and vociferously to pursue this rather bizarre and extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily different kind of, of behavior.